morning, but hi everybody. And today we're going to be talking about President Truman and um, how to end the war in Japan. Um, it's a deliberate title, actually. It's not, um, the title is not the decision to drop the atomic bomb, which tends to be a little black and white, uh, kind of a yes or no answer. We're going to try and broaden the framework of that discussion this afternoon and look at a variety of options. Um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint here in a second. Um, I'm going to invite some uh, contributions from you. We're going to start out with the chat box and then from time to time we may well be able to go to the audio. I'm not exactly sure how many people we have online this afternoon, but let's try the chat box first of all. So let me get my uh, PowerPoint up and we will start the presentation. Let me just get the uh, slideshow going here. So there's where I work is at the Truman Library and Museum in Independence, Missouri. And I've worked there for 23 years since 1997. And today, as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about President Truman and ending the war in Japan. And I serve as the education director there at the Library and Museum where we have uh, a number of um, artifacts and documents related to the Truman presidency and his lifetime. And we may answer questions that a little bit later on, if you like, about the function of the library and the number of documents we have and those kinds of things. But today to stick to our topic, we have to go back a little bit in time. As you know, uh, Truman's um, decision to drop the atomic bomb came in August of 1945. We're gonna go back to the spring, actually into the, to the month we're in right now, in April of 1945, 75 years ago this year, to see a particular event that affected Truman and to put this into context. And you can see from the caption there, it's the Truman becomes president in April of 1945, 75th, 75th anniversary this year. And my first question, which is fairly typical for those of you that have attended some of my other presentations in the last few weeks and months, is what do you notice? So in the chat box, just looking at this one photograph, um, what do you notice in this photograph? Uh, I'm gonna answer a question right off the bat from the chat box. This is being recorded. And if it's similar to previous presentations, it will be on the YouTube channel for the Presidential Primary Sources Project. Um, somebody mentioned his inauguration and it's not in the traditional location. That's absolutely correct, Christy, thank you. So this is him taking the oath of office. So what else do you notice in this photograph? Two women, and then the rest are all men. And in a follow-up photograph, in a moment, I'm gonna show you a third woman that's in the room, but there are two women at the moment. One, person, one woman is obscured. Somebody is very knowledgeable, notices that the portrait of Woodrow Wilson is in the background kind of looming above the clock there. Um, so you can see that. Um, so let's test your history a little bit. What has happened that Truman is taking the oath of office in this unusual situation? Brian notices that they look very solemn and then suddenly a, a whole range of answers that you all know that FDR has died. So Truman of course was vice president this is the day that FDR has died and Truman is rushed over to the White House to be informed by Eleanor Roosevelt what has happened. And so Truman as vice president becomes president. So a little bit of background here. Um, it is a black and white photo and there is some newsreel of this too out there available. Um, Truman had only been vice president since the January inauguration. So there was an election, presidential election in 1944. Truman was the vice presidential candidate with FDR. And in January, they were inaugurated. And here we are in April, just 82 days later, Truman is sworn in as president. So it's, it's quite a shock that he's the president. Um, and in that time, in that time, those 82 days, Truman formally meets with FDR only twice in those times. Um, as we'll see later on when we look at Truman's dealings with foreign leaders, in that time in February, FDR goes to the Yalta conference to meet with Stalin and Churchill to discuss the end of World War II. 
Truman as vice president doesn't go. So he's really not in the inner circle. You're right, they look very solemn. And I'm gonna point out a couple of people in that photograph. The one is his wife, uh, Bess Truman, and she is right in the center of the photograph. Truman has his hand on the Bible as he swears the oath of office. And then uh, Bess Wallace Truman is right in the center of the photo. Okay, let's take another photo, look at another photo, which is the same event, trust me on that, but a slightly different angle. And you can see the other woman that was obscured from the photograph um, in the first place, in the first photo. So any guesses to who the other lady is now on the right side of the photograph um, for that? And Christy is on it today. It is his daughter, Mary Margaret Truman. She was born in 1924. So in this particular case, she's 21 years of age. And uh, this is actually in the cabinet room, not in the Oval Office. This is in the cabinet room where he takes the oath of office. And as I mentioned before, a rather solemn photograph. So this is kind of the background um, leading up to this. And as we're gonna be talking about um, the atomic bomb here in a moment, and that decision to end the war in Japan, we're gonna look at a letter that Truman receives um, right after this. So this was April 12th. He receives this letter on April 24th. So just 12 days later. And I realize with Zoom and distance learning, you may or may not be able to read this letter that clearly. It is typed but some of you can see it great, says Christy. So that's awesome. Um, and hopefully most of you can. Sometimes when I do these presentations to classrooms, it can be a little tricky for a whole classroom to see it. Whereas most people are probably using an iPad or a desktop computer. Maybe you can read this letter and a number of you are telling me that it's super clear. So that's pretty exciting. So again, similar question, uh, what do you notice on this, on this particular document. And let's, as we got a couple of hands raised there, let's try doing some um, audio. So we get some different voices than mine. We've got a few hands raised and I'm gonna rely on my um, colleague, Therese, to call on a few people um, to respond to this particular document. What do you notice about this document? Sure. Uh, does, if anyone is ready to answer, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, I see Kelly has her hand raised. So Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead, Kelly. It says secret two times on it. it Wait. Th thank you, yes. Kelly. It, do it does say secret on the very good well spotted thank you very much kelly anybody else so we've got a couple in the chat box somebody says ali excuse me ali looking for the name there says foreign relation foreign relations is underlined and then it says there's lots of signatures and writing on the paper it says it's declassified down at the bottom very good what about the content of the letter itself for now, let's focus on that. There's a lot of other extraneous material. Somebody's asking, what does the 386 mean? Okay. Any other things that people are noticing, particularly in the content of the letter? And you can either raise your hand or somebody asked about if FDR was planning to use the atomic bomb. We're going to address that a little bit later on. Sarah or Sarah, excuse me, the person wants to give advice on foreign relations. And Christy says, the letter is about a secret matter. So you guys are keying in on some of the important materials here. So the next part of this is what historians sometimes have to do is to speculate, to kind of make inferences. So what do you think this is about? Kay is right on it, this is very cryptic. Interesting. Interesting that he wrote this rather than calling. Thank you, Brian. The text suggests that it's something important that Truman knows nothing about. Very good. S. Mulzo. 
I'm going to assume the Mulzo is the last name, but I could be wrong. I'm making inferences myself right now. So any speculation about this? World War, because of Secretary War, so World War is still going on. So just for some context, in April of 1945, the war is still going on in Europe, and the war is still going on in Asia in World War II. So neither of those conflicts have wrapped up yet. What could it be about, do you think? Speculation, no wrong answers, at least not from my end of things. So somebody says in, uh, somebody says the nuke in terminology and then the Manhattan Project from S. Molzo and then Ben also says the atomic bomb and that's absolutely correct. So one thing to realize then is that 12 days into Truman's presidency, he is unaware of the Manhattan Project. He's unaware of the development of the atomic bomb, which most people find quite surprising. Just to go back to that photograph that we saw being inaugurated on April 12th, there were some short conversations that evening and the next day to kind of give him a sense of something, but not in a matter of detail. Now also looking at this letter, you can actually see some Truman handwriting at the bottom, and I'm gonna interpret it for you if you don't mind, just because it's in cursive, and those of us at the Truman Library who've worked there a while tend to become more and more familiar with Harry Truman's writing. And we also know the name of his appointment secretary, which nobody else would know necessarily, whose name was Matthew Connolly. So on the bottom of this letter, he writes on his own writing, Matt, so for Matthew, put on list tomorrow. That's hard to read, put on list tomorrow. Then he puts the date, Wednesday 2-5, Wednesday the 25th. And then the scribble underneath that is Truman's initials, HST. So he's telling his appointment secretary that he wants to meet with the Secretary of War the next day to discuss this issue. And that's exactly what happens. You can also see underneath the date, April 24th, 1945, written, and I'm gonna speculate that this was Matthew Connolly's handwriting, because it's a little different than Harry Truman's handwriting, where he writes, saw 425-45, meaning that he did see uh, Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, um, the next day, where they discussed this project um, in more detail. Brian asked that it's odd that it didn't call directly to get the ball rolling, then send a letter. Um, that's a good, that's a good uh, observation. Um, generally, they, they could call each other. Um, I think the fact that it's written this way and it's top secret um, would indicate to Truman not to have too many people around. And maybe if they met privately or not over the phone, there may well be uh, more secrecy involved in the meeting. But again, that's just some inferences. Also, it might be a long um, appointment because he's going to go into detail. And that might be better than on over the phone where President Truman might have questions. It, the fact that he's written, it may well prevent other people are not involved in the conversations to keep the number of people involved um, shortly. So this is a great document to get students involved with. So one of, one of the things I like to do with these presentations is both offer you some information, but also some teaching strategies that you can do with this. And this particular document is actually on the National Archives Docs Teach site with some questions surrounding it. Um, and the title of that particular activity is Highly Secret Matter. So they pull out that first paragraph. We're gonna move on just in terms of time but it's a fascinating document. And one of the big things it shows us is that Truman doesn't know about the detail of the Manhattan Project until uh, April the 25th. So 13 days after he's become president. Now I should say at this point, there has not been a successful test. It's still um, under uh, testing, but they haven't actually done a successful test yet. Somebody asked about the websites in the chat box. The website links are gonna be on the very last slide of today's presentation, so you'll have those. And my email address is there, so I can, uh, you can email me and I will send you the full presentation. So, that was the end of April. By May the 8th, 
which is another significant date for President Truman because it's his birthday. He turns 61 on May the 8th. He announces the surrender of Germany uh, in the European theater of World War II. Uh, that's significant because that's, um, you know, one of the biggest enemies during the war was the German nation. And after D-Day of um, June 6th, 1944, the American and the Allied troops had advanced on Germany from the West and the Soviet forces had advanced from the East. Shortly before this, at the end of April, the Soviet and the American forces had uh, shook hands across the River Elbe. And now by May 8th, on Truman's 61st birthday, he's able to announce that the Germans have surrendered. So just to give you some context now, as the focus of World War II now starts to turn towards the East and towards Japan. One of the things that happens immediately is discussions about Truman meeting with the other world leaders to resolve what to happen after the war is over. So although the war is continuing in Japan, with the war being over in Europe, um, Truman is going to meet with some of the other world leaders to decide what to do um, in regards to Germany and Italy and the rest of Europe now that the war is over. So by July, Truman goes to Germany. He actually goes by a ship and he sails from the United States on the USS Augusta in the middle of July to tour Germany while he's there, but also to meet with some of the other world leaders at what becomes the Potsdam Conference. And we're gonna talk some about that because the intersection of the Manhattan Project and the Potsdam Conference is crucial for our understanding for Truman's uh, decisions as he goes forward. So this is a photograph of Potsdam. It's in the suburb of Berlin in Germany where they decide to meet. And I'm deliberately not giving you the other world leaders' names because I wanna show you a photograph of them and see the sharp ones amongst you. I'm gonna give you a clue. President Truman is in the middle of this triple handshake, but who are the other two people? So this is the easiest question you will answer today. Just type it in the chat box. Who are the other two people in that photograph uh, indicate the one on the left and the one on the right, if you would. And we've got Joseph Stalin and Winston Churchill, and you guys are amazing. You're all getting that right. So Winston Churchill is on the left. Joseph Stalin is on the right. Winston Churchill, of course, is at that time the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain. This is going to change here pretty quickly. And Joseph Stalin is the leader of the Soviet Union. They will be termed the big three and they would meet in Potsdam to discuss among the other things what to do with Germany, but also one of Truman's main aims was to try and get the Soviet Union to, to commit to agreeing to join the war against the Japanese as well. Um, there are meetings between all three of them. There are meetings where Truman just meets with Churchill there are meetings where Truman just meets with Stalin, and there are meetings of the foreign ministers of the various countries where they also meet together over about a two week period. So I'm gonna show you some of the, the other photographs that we have at the Truman Library. TrumanLibrary.gov is our website where you can see some photographs from the Potsdam Conference, even some of them in color, which we are often pleased to have. And there's the same three um, it's a little faded and a little blurry, but Churchill is on the left, Truman in the middle, and Stalin on the right. But I thought you'd appreciate seeing a color photograph. And even higher quality, Churchill is not in this photograph, but I want to point out a couple of people that are really key. You can see Stalin there in his military uniform on the left, and then Harry Truman in the center in his kind of blue-gray suit and a red tie. And the clarity of this photograph is just wonderful. But I wanted to point out two key people, um, two of the people on the right of the photo, the one gentleman on the far right with his left hand down and his right hand across 
is um, belly button, I would say, is Molotov, who was working the most close advisor to Stalin. And Truman had actually met Molotov prior to the conference. Molotov had flown to Washington, D.C. and met with Truman prior to the conference in terms of preparation. And the other, um, to the right of Molotov and two people over from Truman with the gray hair and uh, the suit with the handkerchief sticking out of the left um, pocket there is James Burns, who becomes Truman's um, Secretary of State. The interestingly, James Burns also attended the Yalta conference in February with FDR and had taken handwritten notes for that at the Yalta conference, which Truman was able to use um, in, uh, excuse me, uh, in preparation for the conference. The other reason Truman took um, the ship, the USS Augusta, is so he could spend the time um, discussing with his aides the conference before arrival. We've got a couple of other photos. And one might surprise you because suddenly we have a different representation from the great British delegation. Churchill is not in this photograph. So this is probably one of the harder questions today. Churchill loses the British election during the Potsdam conference and he's replaced by the Labour prime minister in July of 1945. And as I'm British, I tend to know this, but anybody you want to identify the new British prime minister who's on the left of this photograph. Don't be Googling now, I'm getting out your phone and looking up the answers. I guess you could if you want to. Any responses there? It's a tough one. You didn't realize you're gonna be tested today. Uh, so he come, Churchill actually loses the election and this man comes in and his name, I'm pausing as long as I can, his name is Clement Attlee and he's the British Labour Prime Minister that has won the election. He's there the entire time. Both Churchill and Attlee leave for a short time to get the British election results. And then Attlee comes back as the new Prime Minister. Now I want you to think of this from Stalin's perspective because in February, he's met with Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. And now we are in July and he's got two uh, new leaders representing those two countries. Now, the importance of this Potsdam conference is that while they are meeting in the very early parts of the conference, Truman receives this document. And this is actually part of a 14 page report. This is just the first page. And my next document I'm gonna show you is the last page. This is not quite as easy to make out as the first one, but let's do the same question. What do you notice on this document that's dated 18th of July, 1945? So take a moment, see if you can read through that typed document. Some of it is not as clear as it could be, but let's see what we can get from this particular document. So it's from the War Department. Keeley says it's about the atomic bomb test. Great job, Keeley, you are correct. What an explosion is underlined from Kelly. Somebody mentions New Mexico, which is uh, in, this, in point number two. The first full scale test is in quotes. The test was successful by a couple of you there. I apologize for not reading your names quickly. Sarah and Susan saying the test was successful. Now, as I mentioned, this was a 14 page report. So it can be tricky to look at that. The whole document is available on trumanlibrary.gov. They talk about the number of TNT, that it was not dropped from an airplane, that it was from a, that it was very powerful. So even from these three or four paragraphs, you can get in a, uh, quite a lot of information. And you're right, this is from the very um, first test, successful test of the first explosion of the atomic bomb. And this is the Trinity test, that is correct. So the date on the memo is the 18th of July, but the date that the test took place is the 16th of July. Okay, so they've 
done the test and then they've typed of all of that up. So that's really, you've really pulled out a lot there just from this single page. It is kind of informal in nature, I feel. So he says it's not a concise formal report. Um, there's a stamp there on the bottom, people are noticing. Some of it is hard to read. And I'll be honest with you, Bill, it's a little bit easier to read online than it is through the presentation. But let's look at the last page, because I think you'll be stunned by that. Therese, thank you for putting in the link to the website. This is on the last page of the same report. Um, it's submitted by uh, Lieutenant Groves, who's one of the lead people in charge of the tests. This is a sketch, as you can see, and some of the cursive is really tricky to read, but let's see what we can get from this, because I think this is fascinating to use this uh, first-hand primary source of the sketch of the first test of the at atomic bomb. So what can you notice from this test? Sketch, I should say. Drawing of a mushroom cloud says, Mr. Mulsau or Miss Mulsau, I don't know. A cloud drawing. It states the colors of the mushroom cloud. It's got dark brown written in there, light gray, I think. Anything else? It's got the time, it's got the temperature. The colors seem different. So we can see at 5.30 and then at 5.42. So a fascinating document. Some of the cursive is a little tricky, so I'm going to read some of it to you at the bottom. It says see through here. Um, it's messed up, says uh, Bill. It's got the degrees. I'm going to read the section that's underneath where it says cloud drawings on the top left, just because I think it's pertinent, but it is in cursive and it's a little faded. And it says first atomic bomb explosion, Alagomorgo, New Mexico. Sketches from B-29 flying at 30,000 feet about, and then it has a number of miles away. It could be a two, like 25, or it could be 15. I'd have to go back and look at the original to get that exactly correct. But it's interesting that it's taken from a B-29 and that they have sketched it from that plane. So the person on the plane has sketched this. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's kind of fascinating that they were quite a number of miles away. So with the report and with this sketch, Truman was now fully informed about the successful test. Now, up until this point in the summer of 1945, there was a group called the Interim Committee that was giving Truman guidance. So some people were on the ground, but this particular plane was an observation plane when he sketched this. That's correct, Brian. So this group had been uh, meeting throughout the summer, but it wasn't until we had this successful test. Let me go back before we get to this. It wasn't until the successful test that the decision would be a reality. So some of the people in the military, some of Truman's advisors didn't think the, the uh, test could be successful and didn't think that the atomic bomb would become reality. Others were far more confident. Um, the other part of this is that until they had a successful test, there were lots of other options put on the table. Once the test had, been, had succeeded, it was kind of full steam ahead uh, in terms of what to do. Truman's main goal at this time in July of 1945 was to end the war as quickly as possible. Now, um, here's a couple of things to think about here is whether he should tell Joseph Stalin and whether he should tell Winston Churchill and eventually Clement Attlee. Now this test takes place before Churchill leaves. This is very early on in the Potsdam conference within the first day or two of the meeting and Truman tells Churchill pretty much the full details. And the British have been pretty well informed about the Manhattan Project from the outset. Um, he's a little more cryptic when it comes to Stalin. He tells Stalin that they have a new weapon, but he really doesn't go into the detail of it. He um, 
keeps his cards a little closer to his chest and doesn't go into a full detail. As historians have found out later, Stalin actually knew more than Truman realized because he had spies in New Mexico who were really relaying information back to him. So Truman's main goal is to end the war. And the main part of our interaction that we're gonna do now um, to, is to look at Truman's options and kind of weigh the advantages and disadvantage of those as you look at it um, 75 years later. So Truman's options seemingly um, came to four choices. Now, some of these could be combined together. Um, they're not necessarily one ahead of another, but these are some of the things that were brought to his attention or not brought to his attention, but historians have looked at in the 75 years that have passed to look at the different options available to him. So let me talk through those and then we're gonna do an activity. So the first would be to continue the conventional bombing of Japanese cities, which had been going on for some time. And in fact, the spring of 1945 in April and May and into June, um, those had really uh, developed more into firebombing, similar to the bombing in Dresden in Germany by the British. They were firebombing the Japanese cities. So they can continue that to try and uh, get surrender. Truman's main goal is to end the war as quickly as possible. So bear that in mind. The second option would be for a land invasion of Japan and those plans were being formulated and being um, planned out by the military leaders of what a land invasion might look like. A third option which was discussed was to demonstrate the bomb on an unpopulated island with the hope that that might lead to a surrender. And the fourth option is to drop the bomb on an inhabited Japanese city, which we know today is what happened, but we're gonna look at all four of these options. So for this activity for now, we're gonna use the chat box. This might get a little busy. We're gonna look at each of these options one at a time. And what I want you to do, and this might be a little tricky, is try and indicate what would be the advantage or what would be a disadvantage of this particular option? So we're just going to focus on these one at a time rather than all four at once. So what would be an advantage of con continuing conventional bombing? What would be a disadvantage? So you might want to put AD and then a dash or a colon and then say what the advantage would be or you might put DIS and then type in what a disadvantage would be. Now you can look at this from any perspective. So from the United States perspective, from the Japanese perspective, from the Soviet perspective, from the European perspective. Um, and so Sarah Osara has come up with the first one. An advantage would be that less Japanese lost, less Japanese lives lost than the use of atomic bombs. So there we have one. Um, and then Brian has an advantage. It would continue to wear down. And then a disadvantage, the Japanese would be shown they would never surrender. Uh, K has put disadvantage, a cost in terms of manpower, fuel, plans, right? Because it would take so much time. Um, Getting nowhere with this strategy is a disadvantage from Christie, and I'm going to try and keep up with the chat box as much as I can. An advantage would be to lower Japanese morale. A disadvantage would it would take more time and supplies and possible damage to planes, and Japanese might not surrender anyway. Thank you, Keely. Advantage, it might stop the war. We don't know, right? We're speculating. So you can see how this would be a great activity to do with students to try and um, weigh the different advantages and disadvantages. Um, Ali says it may take longer and may not get anything. Um, it may not get surrender for some time. It's the same thing they've been doing as a disadvantage, so it wouldn't make them want to surrender. Uh, John says an advantage would be destroying the ports and shipyards and airports. 
Of the disadvantage, Sara says, would have to be continual bombers. Pilots and bombers in military would have to keep doing this, putting their lives in danger. Uh, advantage, says Ali, less lost American lives since they're in planes, probably um, meaning that that would be a contrast to, say, a land invasion. You guys are amazing. And um, an advantage just came in there, continuing to build alliances with other countries. So as, as you continue in this policy, you can continue it, uh, building alliances with others. I had a few myself, and you guys have added to them, and you can continue to add to those. These lists are not exhaustive. Students may be creative and come up with these themselves. The important thing here is to try and look at it from multiple perspectives. So let me, some of the things I came up with, and you guys came up with all of these and more, so thank you. It would be kind of considered a safe approach. There might be a possibility of a negotiated peace. It might be viewed as being a little more humane, and it might possibly save some lives. All of these are debatable, right? Um, disadvantage, the war might carry on. There might be a worry of stalemate. Some of you mentioned there might be a little chance of surrender. There might be more casualties. Again, it's debatable. Some people, in, when I've done this with students and teachers in the past, have mentioned the American public and their point of view, which is one I often forget about, but it's an important one to consider. You know, would the American public turn against the war if it continues on and on and on? So those are just some things to consider. So now the second one, same thing, land invasion. So what would a land invasion, what would be the advantages of that? What would be the disadvantages of that? And John is just still talking about the previous one, bombers getting shut down by the Japanese fighter planes. Absolutely. And um, the Japanese fighter planes were actually uh, engaged in those types of missions um, in the summer of 45. So on this particular one, uh, many American lives and Japanese lives would be lost through a land invasion, a huge loss of American life. We know from some of the previous uh, invasions of some of the islands like Okawana and others about the huge loss of life. So lots on the disadvantages, cost more lives, and the Japanese might still not surrender, um, risking American soldiers. Christie comes up with an advantage. It may continue to make Japanese nervous that their allies on their own home soil and if they're getting closer to the capital. Creating the plans where to invade, how to invade, so where would they where would they actually do this? What's the reality? It might take more time. They might loss, a lot of you are pointing out the increased loss of lives. It, it, in, enraging the Japanese even more, they would get mad because we're invading their homeland. Um, ships getting destroyed, the kamikaze planes attacking American boats. Um, an advantage, D-Day uh, was successful. Maybe Truman would be interested in a similar strategy. And that was actually discussed that comparison to D-Day came up. They've lost um, so many men. I'm reading Kelly's disadvantage. They will probably lose because they don't have enough soldiers. Uh, take more men than the other options, says Keeley. American public, again, may turn against. Thank you, Sarah, because soldiers' lives would be lost. An advantage, success with the strategy earlier in the war, but it would be a huge loss of life. Um, Brian asked, do we emphasize as teachers, this is from the American perspective, or do we encourage ideas on how it would harm the Japanese? Brian, I think you could do that either way. I think from my perspective, I think the more perspectives you could get, one way to do this would be to do it two separately, advantages and disadvantages from the American point of view, advantages and disadvantage from the Japanese point of view, or you could try and merge them together. You would know your students best of the best approach there, but you could certainly um, look at it from different perspectives and without really making a decision yourself and without really making a decision on the behalf of students, but you're just considering all the viewpoints of these different options. Um, Truman had said he wanted to avoid another Okinawana, says Ingram. And um, so you guys are covering a lot of these. Let me see what I had uh, prepared ahead of time. It's like a, a baking show, right? Here's the, here's the cake I made earlier. I'm going to pull out of the oven. So here's some of the things that you have said. 
And, and I'm bringing up a couple of new things that again, you can debate. So if all went well, you know, surrender might come um, by 1946. That was kind of the speculation by the army. Um, the plans were actually in place to start this land invasion in November of 45, but the plans were that it might come, the, the success would not be until um, the middle of 1946, and who knows how accurate that would be. Probably less casualties, the atomic bomb, but again, that's debatable, and you can argue, the, you can argue all of these advantages and disadvantages, but it's a, it's a worthwhile viewpoint. It's not a fact, and that's the point of this exercise is that kind of all opinions are on the table. There would be no radiation uh, with this particular approach. Again, we're gonna talk a little about radiation as we go forward, um, but radiation really wasn't well understood at that time. Many of you pointed out some of the disadvantages, the fact that war would carry on, casualties on both sides, possibly a stalemate. The American public, a couple of people mentioned that. Um, Couple of things we haven't mentioned, and that's kind of my inside knowledge. But if you've got really knowledgeable students who maybe have done some research on this, uh, secret intelligence did reveal that the Japanese defenses were fairly strong, uh, stronger than we thought. And some of that information was not known until the summer of 1945. So the Japanese defenses were strong and that the secret intelligence was revealing that that was revealing that information. Some of the Japanese codes, some of the communications had been broken by the Americans by this point. So that's how we know that now. Many of the historians writing about this didn't know about this until the late 1990s. So that uh, worth bearing in mind when you look at some of the older histories. We're gonna move on to the third one. I'm glad you appreciate my sense of humor. Uh, demonstrating the bomb on an unpopulated island. So what would be the advantages and disadvantages of this particular option? Demonstrating the bomb on an unpopulated island. And again, type them in as you did before. Um, advance of, advantage of course, certainly uh, less death, little to no lives lost, that it would show the power. It would save innocent civilians more humane um, if it flopped, we would look weak. Thank you, Brian. Um, and maybe show our secrets, kind of show our hand. Um, Ali says the disadvantage is the Japanese may still not surrender. Would it be enough to convince them? Would still destroy wildlife, the environment, things like that. Wouldn't necessarily scare anybody. The Japanese might not care. Lydia says an advantage, it would be more safe. Disadvantage, okay, just seems like a bully. Um, they would get madder, says Bill. So these are some great um, advantages and disadvantages. Not a lot of deaths would be an advantage, says Ali. I'm gonna wait to see if we get a couple more. You guys are doing a great job with this. Okay, okay. Um, not a good analysis of the true impact of the bomb. There's one that I'm not there, and it is kind of tricky. Um, I'm trying to give a clue without giving it away, because I hate to give answers away. Um, how would this be captured in 1945? How would it be spread by the media? That's wonderful, Kay. How would we know? We talk a lot today about fake news and things like that. How would we know? You know, could the, you know is the footage doc doctored? How would the Japanese witness this? Um, People would know we're able to do that, so there wouldn't be a surprise attack, and then they would try and respond and make their own. Think about from the American perspective for the moment, what Americans are in the area and how that might be a disadvantage. While you're thinking of that, Sara mentioned um, the Soviets, the Cold War could have become early, could have begun earlier, excuse me. Um, expats would be upset, so people living in the area. Not just living in the area, people have been involved in the war. Thank you, Ingram. You've got it. Prisoner of war. How would that affect prisoners of war? What, and this, this was, in, this was dis discussed with Truman. What could the Japanese do um, with prisoners of war? They could be executed. They could kill them. So there was some thought, and we're going to see this on the next slide, that actually there was some discussion 
the prisoners of war could have been moved to the unpopulated island. If we were to say, we're going to do this, and it's in the Japanese territory, they could be moved there. So that was seen as a big disadvantage. So let's look at this one. Here's my second cake or third cake that I baked that you could look at. So it might cause Japanese surrender. They could be so terrified by the bomb on an unpopulated island, the Japanese might surrender. Uh, radiation again, and a couple of people mentioned the environment. And the disadvantages, the Japanese might move the prisoner of war into the area we just talked about. It might not work. I know a couple of people mentioned that. In terms of the scientists, only two bombs existed at that time. The third one uh, would not be available until the middle of August. That's a little unfair. You didn't have that information. But if students were to do some research ahead of the time before this activity. Um, and then a lot of you keyed in on the last one. Who would witness this? Who would relay the information, right? Would you have a Japanese representative there? You know, who is, who's going to be the trusted source that you'd rely on? Now we're going to get, of course, to the, to the area that it happened, what the, you know, the decision that did happen. But let's look, let's, to be fair, to look at these four options, what are the advantages and disadvantages here? And these are probably ones you've come up with before, but again, now it's in the context of the others. And so the advantages with the dropping the bomb on an inhabited city like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as you've got the Japanese would be scared in to surrender, that the war would end faster. Sara mentions many, many lives lost. That's absolutely correct. Christy mentions the inhumane nature, that it's frightening and deadly. Tons of deaths, says Kelly. Cost less American lives, says Akili. Not harming American lives, says Ali. Kills lots of people, says Bill. And advantages that it really scare them. Um, Lydia says kills more lives. Uh, Sara says would definitely end the war, shows the full power of the bomb in an urban setting. Uh, John says the disadvantages, the city would take years to rebuild. So you guys have probably thought about these ahead of time and done these before. Lots of innocent lives lost, says Keeley. Thank you for that. Um, would leave grudges, says Sara. Um, might finally turn people against the emperor in Japan. Um, can we ever go back from this, says Christy, now that we've unleashed such a powerful weapon? Absolutely. So it kind of unleashes a new type of technology that there's really no going back from. Lots of long range implications. You guys are covering almost all of these so well. I'm going to again um, show you the answers I prepared earlier. And you guys have got almost all of these. The saving of American lives, the ending the war quickly. And of course, from Truman's perspective, those are the key things. You know, his key goal was to end the war as quickly as possible. Surrender was seen as being very likely. One thing we didn't talk about, but Truman talks about when questioned about the decision, is that revenge for Pearl Harbor was certainly on people's minds. The disadvantages, of course, are the huge loss of Japanese lives. And you guys have mentioned other disadvantages as well. The radiation effects that we didn't really understand at the time, but those are certainly there. The, the United States loses kind of the moral high ground. They're seen as the aggressor, those things. I'm going to read a few more that are in the chat box that I missed. Um, the disadvantages, they can't necessarily communicate surrender. After the bomb, U.S. and Japan became allies and U.S. helped to rebuild the cities. Ali, that is a little bit 2020 and we're fortunate that's happened. Um, but that's an interesting observation. Unconditional surrender uh, would certainly be an advantage. Make the Japanese soldiers more likely want to surrender if their wives, children and family are in danger. That's not what I thought about, but that's a very um, valid point. Um, a dumb thing to do, says Bill. So we're looking for um, particular reasons, Bill. So I appreciate your sentiment. And we're looking for those advantages and disadvantages from multiple perspectives. Again, this is an activity you can do with students. I would certainly give them preparation ahead of time so they understand the history somewhat. We kind of launch right into it today. 
but we, you know, we're under a shorter time span. Let's just kind of, well, I've summed them all up in a chart for you. So if you want this PowerPoint later, you have them and you can add to these. This is not an exhaustive list, but you could present these to students. What I have not done is asked what you think is the best and you don't have to do that. You could just leave it there with these advantages and disadvantages, but you could, if you wanted to, you could then have students write a position paper uh, on which of these four options they think would be the correct choice or not. You can just continue to deliberate, but of course you have to weigh, weigh all four options rather than just a black and white yes and no. Um, response. Um, what happened in the conference that we mentioned earlier is that the three world leaders, um, Stalin, Truman, and Attlee, uh, ultimately issued to the Japanese asking them for surrender. It really came more from the Americans and the, the Soviets were not too happy about that. They weren't in full disclosure about that. Truman wanted a quick response because the Russians had agreed to join the war and they came in and invaded into Japan in between the two atomic bombs. And then during those discussions, Truman knew he had this weapon um, he, in the declaration to the Japanese asking for their surrender. He does not tell them about the atomic bomb. He implies that there's a new weapon, but he doesn't really go into any detail. So the Japanese are unaware of it through the Potsdam Declaration, which the Japanese ignore. And it's not until after the atomic bombs are dropped that um, they uh, announce their surrender. I'm not gonna stop and discuss these documents um, like I may have done just because of time, but I wanted to show you some of the communication that Truman received while he's in Germany, um, where they're basically telling Truman about the successful test and the dramatic results and about releasing statements to the media after the bomb is dropped in Japan. And this is a reply to Truman where he's agreeing to release statements to the media after the bomb is dropped. So when he says release when ready, he's actually not referring, which is on the third line of this memo by Truman. He's not referring to release the bomb but he's referring to releasing the information to the media, the press release or the press statement. Um, but that's as close as we have to a document where Truman releases information about the top secret nature of the atomic bomb to the general public. This is kind of the uh, official report from the USS Augusta, which is where Truman is when the bomb is dropped on Hiroshima, he's actually sailing back from Europe to the United States on the USS Augusta when he finds out about the first news of the atomic bomb. And he shares that with the staff and the sailors and the military on the USS Augusta when he's sailing back across the Atlantic Ocean. And you can see some of that information there. And I'm gonna show you um, a, a video that we have of a newsreel that a Truman released to the general public. And let me uh, stop sharing this. I've left the link in uh, so you can get it yourself later. And now I'm gonna switch to the video. Technology is wonderful. I'm gonna go full screen. And you'll notice in the top left corner, the window on the USS Augusta. And then let me play this statement. It's about three minutes long. We can't hear the audio, Mark. Here we go. Can you turn it up a little bit more? The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many. Let me, let me back out. A short time ago, Perfect. an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. 
That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws this power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Let there be no mistake, we shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. It was to spare the Japanese people from utter destruction that the ultimatum of July the 26th was issued at Potsdam. Their leaders promptly rejected that ultimatum. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Behind this air attack will follow sea and land forces in such numbers and power as they have not yet seen and with the fighting skill of which they are already well aware. Okay, let me go back to my PowerPoint. I think that's a very dramatic video and that was the link is on the so are you be therese can you see the powerpoint again yep i can see it okay so i just wanted to sum up and then we have some time for questions i know we've gone a little bit long on time um this is a quote from truman where he um continued through his life that it was a necessary decision it's probably seen as one of the most controversial presidential decisions. Um, often, and the reason I pulled this quote up is even though this was in 1958, you know, 13 years later, in the third paragraph, he mentions Pearl Harbor. And in any correspondence I've seen and any communication I've seen about people questioning um, his decision, he often mentions Pearl Harbor as um, motivation. So whether you agree with that or not, I'm not here to say, I'm just in giving you the information. So just in terms of activities, a couple of things that I would suggest, and these are links on here, the docs teach through the National Archives, docsteach.org, has an activity on that highly secret matter document that um, we showed earlier. There's document analysis worksheets that you can look at. There's a number of documents on Truman Library's website um, that a couple of you asked me to retype the website to trumanlibrary.gov. And then you can look at our online documents. And there's a whole section on um, the ending of the war in Japan. And then the Truman Library itself has a lesson plan database. But I also wanted to make mention of Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes children's book. And um, we have at the Truman Library an original paper crane from the Sadako family. And if you're not familiar with that, I'm not gonna do a spoiler. I think that's an interesting way to look at that through literature and through a story of a Sadako who uh, ultimately died as a result of radiation and cancer. But it's a heartwarming story that's connected with Truman's grandson now he was given, Truman's grandson, Clifton Truman Daniel, was given uh, one of the last thousand paper cranes created by Sadako, which is now in the collections of the Truman Library Museum and will be on display when we reopen our museum, which is undergoing renovation right now uh, in the fall of 2020. So with that, um, 
I'm going to go to questions. My email address is up there. So if you'd like a copy of the presentation, just email me and I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions. I'm going to leave that on there so you can see it. And then Therese has also typed it in the box as well. So with that, I'm going to stop share so you can see me more. And if you've got questions, let's go ahead and do them in the chat box as it just seems to be a little bit easier. Somebody asked if we're going to be doing an another Truman Library will be doing another one two weeks today. I'll be doing that and it's about the Berlin airlift at the candy bomber. And a spoiler alert, we'll also be talking about a dog that was involved in the Berlin airlift and a camel that was involved in the Berlin airlift. So I'll be doing this the same time two weeks today about the Berlin airlift and the candy bomber. So a couple of you asked about that. And there may well be more. There's certainly others through the National Archives. So I encourage you to look at um, the National Archives um, blog post about other presentations, but I will be doing one in two weeks time on the Berlin blockade, the candy bomber, and also some snippets about a camel that was a mascot and a dog that wore a parachute. Questions now, um, thank yous, I'll take those. Do you think there was a chance of the bomber with the bomb getting shot down? There could have been, I've not seen any information about that, I can only, um, base mine because it was such a secret attack and they were at such a high elevation they did come in fairly low but not as low as you might think uh, i think that was unlikely does it matter if the advantages and maybe let's see does it matter if the advantages disadvantages might be more than advantages in truman options meaning are the kids led you know brian i would just keep exploring it sometimes an advantage may weigh really heavily. You might just have one, but how do you weight that advantage and disadvantage? So, you know, the killing of thousands of people through the atomic bomb may be seen as one disadvantage, but put that on a scale, weigh it. What are your, I would have your students decide. I am not here to tell you uh, how to interpret that. I would, you could weigh one advantage or one disadvantage, you know, 99%. So, uh, have them weigh those advantages and disadvantages. I will be talking about Vittles, Keeley, in, uh, in the Berlin blockade in two weeks. Therese has put the link to the future webinars. It's not the most friendly um, link in the world, but the link is the. And Jane said, thank you. So maybe that was enough. Any other questions? You guys participated super well. I know it's hard with lots of people. Um, will I be able to do a presentation on Truman and the Korean War? Depending how long this goes on, I don't see that that would be a problem. So let me think about that one um, for the future. If you would like the PowerPoint, please email me. I think Therese had it up there earlier, mark.adams at nara.gov, Brian, and I will email you the PowerPoint and anybody else emails me. Therese, if you don't mind typing in my email address again. Uh, Christy, excited. We have some background, but they will benefit from this critical thinking exercise. That was the point, Christy. So you've made me very happy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stewart. And then Therese has put my email address in there again. Uh, not just for a, respond, a request in the PowerPoint, but if you need directing to particular links, particular resources, anything to do with Truman's presidency, but also his whole life. I mentioned at the beginning, I've worked there 23 years, so I can point you to other resources as well. If not, I'll give about 30 more seconds. Um, somebody asked about Truman's suggesting use of the bomb in Korea, we're getting off topic. That was more MacArthur. MacArthur was pointing to use the bomb uh, actually in China. Uh, he was worried about China's involvement in North Korea and Truman, although he considered it and he made a bit of a misstatement to the press, ultimately he came down that he didn't want to use the atomic bomb during the Korean War. And that was more of a MacArthur decision. And one of the things that they disagreed on and eventually Truman fired MacArthur. Um, thank you, Brian, for bringing up those compliments. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Better to use lesson online or in person? 
I'm not sure if that's a question for me. Um, I think probably in person, I'll tell you why. Um, I would have the students in groups doing the disadvantages and advantages to share their ideas. If you can figure out a way to do groups virtually, you might have that set up with your virtual classrooms right now. It seems like having groups wrestle over these advantages and disadvantages might allow for differences of opinion to emerge. That's just off the top of my head. So breakout groups is exactly right. Yeah, so each group, each group could look at each advantage and disadvantage and maybe share those around the room um, or maybe do a different one each day or however you wanna work that out. But I think the more viewpoints, trying to get students to look at it from a different perspective, I think is a wonderful critical thinking skill. They don't have to agree with it. They're just trying to come up with it from a different point of view. So I think Brian, we might be on the same page with that. But of course, in these times, everything is online. So you may have to try it out there first. I'm, I'm not sure. Any final questions? We've gone past two o'clock central. So I've kept you longer than I intended, but I appreciate the participation and the feedback. And please email me with any questions or if you'd like the PowerPoint. All right, thank you so much, Mark. We really appreciate it. And thank you for everybody that attended. A big thanks to Therese for, for coordinating. Yeah, no problem. All right, everybody have a great day.